Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through the Mushoku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 12, chapter 10. Thanks to everybody that stuck around. <laughs> I figured everybody would just want to flee from Mushoku Mondays after last week and my sobbing, idiotic self. But, um, yeah, for those that stuck around, I guess you're going to be in for more of it because I'm sure this chapter is going to get me as well. Uh, it just kind of continues on. I kind of mentioned it last week. It just kind of continues on with just another another sore spot for me personally that I don't know how I'm going to react to it. At the same time, again, technically further into the chapter, we're getting right back into, yes, uh, fatherhood and acknowledging something that got me a little bit emotional as well. Just 9 through 11 pretty much just doesn't let up. It just doesn't <laughs> let up. Refugian's like, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to keep hitting you for three chapters straight. Get ready for it. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, my my teaser for this episode. But as usual, definitely appreciate you guys dropping by. Everybody that's here for the premieres. Hey, chat. How's it going? Thank you so much for your support. Uh, all those that share out. Everybody that hits the like button. If you have not already hit that like button. Additionally, all those that support the channel monetarily through Patreon tips, links, super thanks, memberships, all that stuff. Super fantastic. Really appreciate it. This is my first time recording since the crazy, <laughs> the crazy uh, Mushoku Mondays that was two times ago, which, uh, yeah, you guys went crazy. Noah, Nicholas, I, I really appreciate it, guys. You guys, that means so much to me. It, I got all emotion. I'm like, I thank goodness I'm not <laughs> live streaming right now, because otherwise I'm going to break. Uh, it really means a lot to me. I, I really appreciate it, guys. It's just... The support is what makes this happen, and it's like both monetarily to keep things going, but also just keeps me going. That that kind of support keeps me going. Uh, but yeah, with all that sappy stuff out of the way, let's jump into this. Let's see, let's see how far I can go this time around. But uh, yes, chapter 10, Parents. When the Hydra breathed its last breath, the magically imbued crystal liquefied. Zenith collapsed onto the ground, alive. Still unconscious, but breathing. There was dozens of enormous magically imbued crystals in the area, and the ground was littered with magic stones that comprised of the creature's scales. Further within was a plethora of fallen magic items too. All would net a fine price, but none of them were in the mood to start collecting them. This is kind of what I was sort of expecting to happen after what happened previously, is this idea of like, there should be a celebration right now. They should be super happy. Zenith is free. There's there's bucos of money everywhere. And I'm curious if eventually they will kind of reveal that, yeah, somebody went back down there. Maybe geese handle it. Because I can see a lot of them being broken about this whole situation. But still a lot of them seeing that this is something they're going to need. Especially if Zenith ends up being in the state she is. Somebody's going to want to go back down there and go, okay, we need to secure this money. Make some value out of this. Not that we want to be rich. But that... They're going to need this money. They need this. They need this to be able to take care of Zenith going forward. So I'm kind of curious. Eventually they'll go, look, somebody went down there, gathered everything, sold it or whatever. Here's the money for it. Because while it's not a, a moment of greed, it's still important. Money is still important in the end. As much as some people, like I, like I say several times this this whole YouTube channel, is like I don't want to be rich doing YouTube. I don't want a massive billions of views every video type of uh, atmosphere here. I want this small community that, you know, I can kind of communicate with that doesn't get too big, doesn't get too wild, and just enough to get me going. Because in the end, still, money is needed. And like I said before, they're going to need this for Zenith. They're going to need some way of taking care of her. And there's a chance that there's going to be some way that they can help her recover that's going to cost a lot of money. Maybe spells or whatever from a certain organization that they're going to need a lot of money for. But no, it is kind of sad in the idea that this should be a celebration point. They have bucos of money here. There's a lot of money here. Dozens of stones. Tons of magical items. Again, that was what they were hitting on when they first started talking about labyrinths. It's this idea that a lot of them just want those magic items because it could have some sort of magic imbued to it that can make it worth a fortune. Rudius felt light. Unsteady as if in a dream. If someone called out to him, he would reply, but his mind was otherwise empty. It's kind of like on an autopilot. Yet he was able to make short work of the task that remains afterwards. This hurts. This really hurts. They cremated Paul's body in that room. Reese's feelings about it was complicated. Part of him wanted to take him home, at least let Zenith see his face. But in the end, 
Ruiz followed everyone's recommendation. His fire magic reduced him to bones in minutes. And then to make, and then to make matters worse, and Elise warned him that burying him like this would result in reanimating as skeletons. So he did as proposed, crushing bones down, conjuring a jar with earth magic and pouring them inside. Like not only do you have to burn your father, then you have to crush him into nothing. It's like, it, it, it's making it worse and worse and worse. You get closure from it. You don't have to have that worry about later on somebody being killed by him. But at the same time, this is super unsettling. I mean, the worst that I have of that experience of at least getting rid of something afterwards is like dogs. We have lots of dogs and on a regular basis, yes, they'll pass away and you have to bury them. It's just not, it's like to add on to you sobbing about the fact that they're passed away, you also have to do this arduous task. And then you have that emotional point again when you're covering them up. It, I mean, it was equally for me, like having somebody you lose and having them have to be taken away. None of it gives you like closure. None of it helps the situation. It just makes it worse. The only things left behind of Paul was his breastplate, his new left sword, and his favorite sword that he held at his side since Rudius was born. Rudius felt strange. He couldn't put his finger on what this emotion was. It's loss, dude. <laughs> it's sorrow. It's loss. It's loss. It's heartbreak. It's agony. It's regrets. There's like so many that I can probably guess here. He felt like a weight was crushing down on his chest. I know we're gonna get into this later, but it's literally what he didn't get in his previous life. That's what sucks about this. He wasn't so much useful on the way back. They beat their enemies and he used magic, but his feet were unsteady. If it weren't for Roxy pressed close beside him, he might've stepped on a trap. So she's gonna have to stand on the side like, uh, no, Rudius, don't touch that. <laughs> it's like the girl that actually accidentally stepped on a trap and felt so bad about it is now literally trying to keep him from stepping on them, which did kind of answer a really interesting question that I had. My question mark that I had, and I, I'm sorry I'm derailing here when it's really emotional, but I do want to keep hitting all these points. The assumption is that this labyrinth is a breathing thing, and the heart of it is this core. And everything kind of being drawn down to it. Mana of dead things is being drawn down to this core. The monsters are drawn down to that core to consume it. And then when they die inside there, they die, and then the mana gets drawn to the center. Every equipment and stuff within there is getting hit by this mana as it's flowing through, and they become magic items. But my assumption is that when that heart dies... This living, breathing thing dies. Now, it is assumed that probably the the structure of it probably just stays as is, maybe crumbles over time. But I assume that things like these circles, these traps, would deactivate. I mean, they don't have something that's supplying them. So maybe they have residual mana that's within them and it keeps them going. But you assume that all these traps and stuff would just kind of stop. Again, assuming that how the traps themselves are being created. Is it being created by the monsters? Is it being created by the living labyrinth itself? It's just producing them um, in different areas? That's the question mark. But this is kind of indicating that, no, these things are still active. And again, that could just be residuals. No matter how many mistakes Rudius made, no one said a word. No complaints, no consolations. Everyone was at a loss for words. It's just like a very quiet quiet walk back. It took them three days to exit the labyrinth. And this is what sucks, because if you think about it, 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 he doesn't really touch on it at all. They're having to make their way back up, and literally, they're without Paul. And remember, Paul was like their armored warrior destroyer. Like, he had it. Now, granted, I'm, I'm gonna assume that Ellen Elise probably took his sword so that she could take down those. That's kind of the bad thing about the boss themselves. It's not just taking down the boss. It's not surviving the boss. It's also the fact that if you lose anybody fighting a very powerful boss, that makes it more difficult to get back out alive. Could you imagine if everybody in the party died except for, let's say, Talhand? I don't think Talhand could make it back out alive. He might even have to hide somewhere and hope that somebody comes by or at least go quickly so you can get out before things respawn. Respawn. Rebirth. <laughs> I don't know. It took them three days to exit the labyrinth. Back at the city, Geese and El Elise explained the situation to the others. Shiera collapsed in tears. Viera sank to her knees with a look of shock. Rudius couldn't say anything. He didn't say a single word. Lilia was different. <laughs> she had a face of a mask, revealing nothing as she looked at Rudius and squeezed her arms around him. Oof. It must have been difficult. You did well. Try to get some rest and leave everything to me. Rudius felt empty and simply nodded. She literally understands the situation quickly. All right, this boy is broken. Go rest. I'll handle Zenith. Like she's just putting aside her own emotions because she knows she needs to take care of this. 
I sort of had the same feeling when um, my father passed, is I knew that I needed to take care of things in place of those that were more sorrowful than me. Now, granted, I was I was equally as sorrowful as other people. I just felt the necessity to bottle it up and take care of the situation. I felt that I need to help them in their place. And I actually had that situation with a grandmother. When she passed away, my mother was destroyed, obviously. And it was so sad because there is a, there's sort of a negative aspect of that. Not that I blame anybody for it, but myself. This idea that when you, you see there's a loss and you see that people are obviously destroyed by it and you choose to bottle it up and not show, whether it because you're trying to be strong or that you know that you need to step up. It took me years, years before it finally hit me. And that was the tragic thing about it. What I should have broken down over here, I finally had my moment years later. I just had an entire night of just breaking down. Eventually, it's gonna have to come out. <laughs> there is a healing aspect of being sorrowful. There is a healing aspect of letting it out. Returning to the inn, Rudius shed his robe. He knew that he needed to stitch it up, but he just tossed it to the corner with his staff and his bag and collapsed on the bed. That night, he dreamt of being in his old body. But he wasn't in the white room. There was no man god. He was back to being a slow-witted, self-demeaning shut-in. But this time, it was memories of his previous life. Unsure of when it took place, he at least knew it looked familiar. It was the living room of his parents' house. His parents were there. They were speaking about him, but he couldn't hear their voices. Were they worried about him back then? Oh, here it starts. Here it starts. Rudius left that world without discovering the reasons for their deaths. Considering they both went at the same time, he assumed illness, an accident, or perhaps they took their own life. They wonder what they thought of him just before they died. A shameless shut-in? Vexed about how he turned out? Ashamed? He hadn't a clue how they truly felt. His mother popped in occasionally, but his father at some point stopped even saying anything to him. Did he ever cross their minds when they died? But then Rudius thought, what about me? When they died, I didn't even go to their funeral. What was I doing? I didn't even pick up their bones from their ash after cremation, like a child should have done. What the hell was I doing? Why didn't I even go to their funeral? He was scared of the way that people would look at him. When they seen that he wasn't even trying to be sad. Scared of the way they would look at that piece of yeah. shut in. Their hostility. Contempt. But that wasn't the whole story, of course. He wasn't an honorable human being. At that time, he hadn't felt an ounce of sadness at their passing. He didn't love them enough to grieve. His concern wasn't their death. It was thinking, oh yeah. Now what am I gonna do? He couldn't even look directly at his own future. <laughs> and it's so interesting that we're technically re, we're, we're going back into this story. That's what's so interesting about this. It's, this is the same story. Rudeus's past is the same story. Now granted, every time we'll get a little bit more insight into each of the characters that were around him. Like with the whole situation with Norn, it was about his brother. By the way, my brother was there, <laughs> but I didn't listen to him. He was trying to get to me, and now I want to go back and say thank you. This is the same situation. We're getting a little bit more insight into the surrounding, but the whole point of this is now a new perspective. Every time he comes back to the story, it's a different angle. It's a different perspective. It's a different mindset. Now it's Paul died, and I am really emotional. I don't know why. What is this feeling in my chest? And now, wait, my parents died in the other world too. What did I do? I didn't do anything. Why, why didn't I do anything? Of course, Rudius wasn't justifying his behavior back then, but he couldn't help it. Imagine being backed into a corner, losing that last source of salvation you have, being suddenly plunged into the vast ocean before you without being able to fill your lungs with air. Anyone in that position would look to escape reality. He regretted not doing more, but he could only blame himself so much. He was scared. And this is kind of goes in that area of just kind of un understanding every side. This is sort of why I like to be sort of in the middle with a lot of these kind of, here's two options. I never like to be in those two options. I like to be right here so that I can view both options. I can see what each side is saying and figure out for myself what makes sense. And what I usually find with that is that I understand both sides and I can say, you're not wrong, but you're not wrong either. Yeah, you're you're kind of a scumbag for not going to their funeral, 
that that does kind of hurt, dude. I, I can never see myself doing that. But at the same time, I go, yeah, I understand what you were doing here. I understand that you were terrified. I understand that you were stuck in that room for so long. I've I've gotten that. I've had times where I, I just think about, but if I go out there, what will they say? But if I go over there, what will they say? But if I go to that venue, what will those people say? I had a falling out with this person. They were there before me. If I get there, everybody's probably going to hate me. What's the point of even going? That's the problem that always comes from it. But I think the important thing to is, is to at least acknowledge it. At least acknowledge that that is your weakness. That way you know how to sort of resolve it next time. Why didn't you go? Because you were afraid about what they would say. Well, then sort of change what they would say about you. Now, granted, that's not going to work. It's not always going to work. That's not a fix-all. <laughs> it's like everything with this. It's like I propose things, but I always ex ag acknowledge that this isn't a fix-all. That's why every situation like this is different for every person. And we'll get into that later on with what Roxy says and how he, he lashes out at her. This idea of, I understand. Gosh, we talked about that with the whole situation with Zenoba talking to Rudius. I can't understand you, but I'll be here for you. I have an, an abundance of, I have an abundance of strength. That's about all I have. And it's there for you. I'm here for you. Just listen, as I said back then. I just listen. I can at least give you this. I can't fix everything. Where was I at? <laughs> I get so sidetracked. What was I talking about? Oh, uh, anyways. Oh, gosh. Still, he wondered if he should have at least attended their funeral. He had no idea what he had been thinking back then. But maybe, at least, look at their faces after they passed. At least have picked up their bones. How did Paul's face look as he passed? It hadn't been satisfaction written on his face. But Rudy's seen the edge of his lip curl in a smile of relief. What did he try to say in the end? What expression did his parents wear when they passed? Why didn't he look back then? He wished he could go back now and see. Regrets. Regrets. But again, I still think Paul was relieved that Rudius survived. That Rudius, again, like I said before, his genius son, not useless father, survived. Rudius can handle things from here on out. If Rudius were to die, I wouldn't be able to handle things out here on out. He's more useful to me. He's important to live. And yes, he's my son. That's my son. No matter how much he thinks I don't love him, he's my son. Which so breaks me here in a minute. <laughs> God. Rudius felt awful the next day. An intense desire to do nothing weighed down his entire body. To escape, he was just about there. Like this was literally, he was about there. And he knew it. He knew he felt it, I think. To escape it, he forced himself to head to the room that Lilia and Zenith were in. Lilia stared in amazement. Lord Rudius, you've recovered already? Yeah, for the moment. I can't be the only one to take it easy, right? I'm certain no one would complain if you were to rest a bit more. He really did want to crawl back in bed, but he sensed that he had to do something. He had to move. Again, I think him real. I think I think this is him realizing he was going to become a shut-in. He still technically does it. But right here, he's like, I got to get up. I know what this feeling is. I know if I stay here, I won't come out. And it's so sad because something will be the thing that hits him and says, get back in that room. Go back to being where you were at. Go back in there. It's safe there. It's safe there. Just don't think about this stuff. Just go in there and be in there. Oof. And I'm really surprised. I'm curious if it'll get into it because I haven't read too far ahead like, like I usually do. I'm, a, I'm wondering if it eventually will get to the point where he'll acknowledge that. I was stuck in there. I did it again. I think it sort of hits on it at the end of 11. I, I don't remember. It was a rough couple of days. Please, let me stay here. All right. I understand. Feel free to sit. The two of them watched over Zenith together. She had been sleeping for days now. Three days to exit the labyrinth and a day to return to town. Outwardly, she seemed perfectly healthy. No signs of losing weight. She merely looked like she was sleeping. He thought that she would look a bit older, but that wasn't the case. Yeah, the assumption is here is that, yeah, she may have aged a little bit up to the point where the displacement incident happened. But once that displacement incident happened, it's like she froze. Froze her and solid, like just no aging or anything. Her hands were warm and you could hear her breathing. The thought of her staying asleep forever passed through his mind. Her body deteriorating and her dying. A thought he kept to himself. Ruiz and Lilia watched over her quietly. 
Vera and Shira would come by to chat, but none of it stuck in his head. Alone, Rudius and Lilia would eat together, even though he had a little sense of being hungry, barely swallowing anything and trying to force food down with water. The food would stick in his throat and made him gag. Finally, early afternoon, while Rudius, Lilia, and Vera were there, Zenith showed signs of change. She let out a, oh my gosh, this is gonna suck. This is gonna suck. <laughs> this is gonna suck. <clears throat> It's gonna suck. Uh, terrible man crying incoming, probably. We'll see. She let out a small groan and slowly lifted her eyes open. Viera rushed out of the room to inform the others. Lilia and Rudius watched as Zenith tried to lift herself up. Being bedridden for days, and yes, technically, if you may, let's, let's not remember the fact that it's been years, Rudius. At least bedridden for days. Because again, you can assume that she was stuck in animation back then. But being bedridden for days, it was difficult, but Lilia assisted her. Good morning, my lady. Lilia smiled. Zenith regarded her with a face not completely shaken off sleep. Mm. It was a voice Rudius recognized. The same voice he heard when he was born into this world. A calming one. Relief washed over him. <sighs> Paul had died, but at least the one he tried to rescue was safe now. Safe and alive. His hopes were realized. She would be sad to learn of his death. She might even cry. But at least the three of them together would share the loss together. Oof. Mother. But that was for later. After things calmed down a bit, and she understood what was going on, one step at a time. First, they needed to rejoice that she was alive and they were reunited. They could be sad later. Nope. It's gonna come real quick, Curtis. Hmm? Zenith tilted her head slightly. He stilled his heart. She had forgotten me? Though, he couldn't blame her. Same thing happened with Roxy. They were apart for years and his face changed. It might be a shock for her now, but they could laugh about it in years to come. My lady, this is Lord Rudius. Ten years have passed since you last saw him. Zenith stared vacantly. Sorry, Andrew. Wait, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> she, looked at, she looked at Lilia, her eyes like a mirror empty, reflecting only what they saw before them. Zenith tilted her head again. Lilia's eyes went wide. Something was wrong. She wasn't speaking. All she did was groan. The way she moved, it was as if she forgotten Lilia as well. Ruiz was one thing, but Lilia was different. Sure, she aged, but she hadn't changed much. She was still wearing the same clothes that she always did. Her hair was the same and everything. Oh, ah. Her voice was clumsy, eyes blank. And she couldn't form words. All she did was stare at them. My lady, could it be that Lilia realized it too? He knew what she left unspoken, but his heart quickly dismissed it. They tried numerous times to talk to her. The conclusion came quick. Zenith reacted to their voices, but produced no words of her own. And she also showed no signs of comprehending what they were saying. Lord Rudius, I'm afraid she's lost it all. Indeed, Zenith lost everything. Her memories, knowledge, intelligence all necessary components that formed a person. She was a husk. There was no way that she would remember Paul. She didn't even remember Rudius or Lilia. That meant that she couldn't even be sad that Paul had died. They couldn't share the loss. The reality of that stabbed like a knife. This sucks, cause I, I'm, I'm, I was very shocked about how he, what, where his mind went with the situation. Again, my mindset is immediately Okay, they went in there, they fought, Paul sacrificed himself, Zenith survives, and you think, okay, Paul sacrificed, but he got what he wanted. At least she survived. At least he, this was given for this, equal exchange. But in the end, it becomes this mindset of, but was it equal? Zenith was, is just a husk. What did we gain from this? But no, he takes it from perspective of, I was hoping that we could share in the loss of Paul together. I was hoping that with her here, we would celebrate that we reunited and at least we can all sit together and sob over the loss of Paul. This would allow me to essentially give up some of this weight that was on my shoulders. Some of this sorrow I can just take and go here, Zenith, take some of this, please. That's the vantage point that he's taken here, which is really interesting. I wasn't even expecting this. But yes, obviously the thing that stabs me right here is just, there's nothing Nothing, nothing worse, even though I said something last time about this, nothing worse than somebody you love physically 
uh, by all appearance being there, but having nothing inside. That blank stare of who are you? And you're just... Dementia sucks, by the way. <laughs> Dementia, Alzheimer, any sort of memory loss, anything that affects the brain itself, it sucks. Because the, on one hand, there's an element of somebody dying from, you know, some sort of impact, damage, illness, something like that. There's something so much different than the one you've loved for so many years of your life. 10, 20, 30, 40, so on. So many years that you spent with somebody and they don't even know who you are. This is what I was talking about that these two chapters were like double whammy. Because it went from loss, the blank stare of death, life leaving somebody, to somebody that the life isn't leaving them, but their spirit's gone. And everything they love for you is gone. And it sucks because it gets in more into it later, this idea that in this world, Rudius is <laughs> so sucks because he flagged it way back here. Elise had this chunk out of her arm and we healed it like that. Normally it would take a whole bunch of stitches. Healing's amazing. Paul was dead. Zenith was a husk and no healing affected the mind. It's the one thing they seem to imply that healing doesn't affect. It's the mind. Which is interesting because you would imagine that everything else healing wise, it's essentially giving somebody the ability to, like the gash in Ellen Lace's arm. You would assume that somebody that knows healing, that uses healing on that, it recovers the tissue and restores it back to normal. Like it's literally taking something from a state of this opening and restitching it back to normal. Like it's recovering, it's, re it's rewinding time basically. Why doesn't that work for the mind? Why wouldn't that work for the mind? It's essentially doing the same thing. Is the idea because you can't directly contact it? Well, you're not contacting the inner flesh when you're touching a wound. It's, it's stitching it back together. It's like you're shoving your hand inside of a gap. I guess you could be. There, there is nothing worse than... I, when I dealt with the loss of somebody with dementia, there's... It, it, I told myself at that time, I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. I know a lot of people say that about things like cancer, um, but it's equally the same with something like dementia. It's just idea of somebody just, they're embarrassed because they can't function by themselves. They're, again, losing their all perspective of people. They look at you like, who are you? There's there's other cases where thankfully it didn't happen with us. Uh, they become violent because they don't understand or they feel lost or they feel scared or it just affects their brain in a different way than normal. They don't, they lose their their sense of decision making. Um, what normally tells most people this is wrong is sort of lost. Uh, all that stuff, it sucks. And this is what sucks is because it went from, again, losing Paul. And I'm thinking, this is why I read into chapter 10, by the way. It's like, I'm like, okay, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I know it. I rush into chapter 10 and this happens. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I'm like, damn it. I wanted happiness. I wanted something good. Refugion, I wanted something good here. It hurts. I wanted, I wanted this to be Zenith okay. Zenith is okay. Now this, we can get into something later on. We'll see, but oof. Move on, Andrew. Just move on. A gasp escaped Ruiz's throat and his heart shattered. He had no clue how many days passed after that. He went to sleep. He woke up. He went to sleep. He woke up countless times. Here is the beginning of the shut-in. When he slept, his dreams replayed the moments of Paul's death, slashing at the hydra, the swinging of its necks. When Paul shoved him to the side, he watched him move again, watched the hydra move again, but Rudius couldn't move. Paul kicked him out of the way, and he watched as the hydra's head plummeted down in front of him. Then, Rudius jolted awake, checked to make sure it was a dream, then huddled back in bed. He had no willpower to get up. All he could do was think about Paul. Sure, Paul wasn't a praiseworthy human being. He was terrible with women and a show off. Just call him a dirtbag. That's what we do. We just call him dirtbag. <laughs> the lovable Paul the dirtbag. He was weak in the face of adversity and escaped in alcohol. Again, I think Rudius is being too hard on him. I think Paul had the right to be broken the way he was. I just don't see very many people ever being able to handle that. 
that's not a normal situation for most people to be able to handle. It makes me believe that at some point when Rudius, if Rudius has his child, that at some point he's going to have the same situation happen to him and he's going to go, now I know what Paul was talking <laughs> Now I know why Paul was broken up and in a corner. He was weak in the face of adversity and escaped in alcohol. He didn't even say anything fatherly before the battle. By most standards, he was a complete failure as a father. But... <sighs> Rudius... Rudius loved him. I broke when I read that. And I'm breaking again. <laughs> I don't remember if he's ever said that. And if anything, he probably said it out loud to, to kind of go with the situation. But in his mind, he's saying, I loved Paul. It's such an achievement when you see that Rudius finds love. It's such an achievement for somebody so closed off to other people for so long of his life to find love. Now, here was the interesting part. It wasn't the same as the parent and child love that Paul felt for him. To Rudius, Paul was like a partner in crime. That's interesting. That is a very interesting statement. Rudius was mentally older than him, but he had more physical years on him. Yeah, basically the idea that yes, mentally he reincarnated, but Paul is older physically right now. But, and I and this is what jumped in my mind immediately and he sort of follows up with it. He was also probably well ahead of him in life experience. That's the key thing there. None of that really mattered. Age was pointless. When he talked to Paul, he felt like the two of them were on equal footing. He couldn't see him as a father and probably never considered himself as his child. Which again, I don't, necessarily blame him. I, I find that very difficult. You play that scenario in your head of like, how would you actually perceive that? Which again, is what I love about this story versus millions of other isekais is that you can actually think about this. You're given time to really think about this. How would you respond? How would it feel like suddenly one day you wake up and you died? You know, you died in your sleep and the next day, or you get hit by a truck in, and the next day you're, you're waking up as a new child to some total strangers. I, it, I see it being very difficult to connect. And this is from Rudy's perspective that didn't have good relationship with his parents in his previous life. For somebody that has a good relationship with their parents, that would be nearly impossible, I feel. But Paul was different. Paul seen him as his child from the very beginning. Him, who had been a piece of yeah. 30 something recluse on the inside at the time. Him, whose actions thus far had been bizarre. Still, Paul regarded him as family, never turning his eyes away. There was areas where he failed as a father, but never faltered in considering Rudius family. Paul never treated him as a stranger. Rudius was always, always his son. Even despite his abnormalities, he's seen him as his son. I'm so glad he acknowledges this. I'm so glad it sucks that it has to be something he submits in his mind after. But I'm glad that he at least acknowledges this. Paul was a father, always had been, even as he carried burdens far too heavy for him. He continued on to do things for the sake of his family. In the end, even shielding Rudius, using his body as a father to protect him, his son. Every time it says son or father is killing me, stop typing that. I need you to do a control, I need to do a find, replace his father, his son with blank. Every time I read that, it kills me. Bravely putting his life on the line as if it was the most natural thing in the world. And he died. It was strange. Rudius wasn't even his child. But Paul was still his father. You don't think you're his child. But you're his child. Paul had two real children. Not fakes like him. Two sweet, genuine daughters. Norn and Aisha. If he was going to shield anyone, it should have been them. He also had two wives. He spent years desperately searching for one. The other was supporting him the whole time. Two wives, two daughters, four people in total. What the hell are you doing leaving them behind, Paul? Rudius thought angrily. Weren't they important to you? But maybe Rudius was important to him too. Two wives, two daughters, and one son. Maybe they were all equally important to him. I like this to cap end literally what he was talking about when Paul and him and Lilia were inside that room together. He was making this list of, here's the important people, and I'm way at the end, nobody cares about me. 
No. There's that chart that you had. Equal. Equal. Again, Rudius, you keep forgetting. You're special to him. And you were seen as this genius son. Yes, there was this comment here and there about, wow, your son's really great. Too bad you aren't. He was probably extremely proud of Rudius. My son is so great. It's what he said to him just before they went off the battle. You're calm. You're thinking of all this stuff. You're better than me. He was probably proud on the inside. God dang, my son's so great. And when, when Rudius complimented him, he was probably like, my genius son just said how cool I am. How great was that feeling? Now granted, it's probably more of that aspect of a son seeing you as being great because that's what every father wants. Every father dreams the day that if their son or daughter says, you're so fantastic, you are a great father. That's all they look for. But it's still an interesting point to make here in this idea of, why me? I'm just this, this piece of crap from another world. I'm not your real son. Paul doesn't know that. And I don't, I think that if Rudius told Paul really early on in his life, you know, he's maybe just old enough to make a conversation with Paul. And he says, hey, Paul, look, just let you know, I'm from another world. And I lived for like, you know, this long time and I died and I came over here. And so that's why I've been always weird is because I'm just somebody else. Um, don't know what happened to your real son. If I replaced him or if I was just put into, I don't know, some little tadpoles. I don't know. I don't know how I got here, but just so you know, I had a previous life. I think it would probably put Paul off quite a bit, but I think there is still an element of impact there. Like Rudius still impact upon him. He's seen his child come out of his wife. He held him in his arms. Now, granted, if he said something when he was holding his arms, it would probably make sense. They would probably think he's demons possessed. They'd probably go through the whole thing that Lilia did about getting an exorcism going on. Um, I think it may have changed things, but I think there's still an impact there. But in the end, it's the aspect of Rudius doesn't, is, is disconnected there. He's always been disconnected there. Paul never had that problem. He never seen you as somebody else. He always seen you as my son. Rudius never seen Paul as a father, but Paul thought of him as one of the most important people in his life. Ah. Yeah. Why, Paul? Give me a break. You said it so many times. Rudy, I see you as adult now. I see you as a man. I got married, bought a house, took guardianship of my sisters. Of course I felt like an adult. I came to help you, worked hard in that labyrinth. I saw myself as an adult. You did too, didn't you? That was why you said what you did at the end, right? Save her, even if it kills you. So explain to me, why? Why? Why did you shield me? If I'm an adult, what am I supposed to say to Nora and Aisha when I go home? How am I supposed to explain them what happened? What am I supposed to do with Zenith, the way she is now? What am I supposed to do from here on out? Tell me, Paul. You were supposed to decide this, weren't you? Damn it. Why did you have to go and die? Yeah. Deja vu. <sighs> mm. <sighs> At least if I had died, it would be him here anguishing over what to do instead. Or better yet, if neither of us had died, no one would have to suffer. Ah, can't do it. Sadness bottled up in him. He couldn't stop the tears that came flooding out. In my life, my previous one, I didn't even cry when my mother and father had died. I hadn't even felt sad. Now that Paul was dead, the tears came naturally. I was sad. I couldn't believe it. The one person who had to be here, was supposed to be here, was now gone. Paul was a father. Paul was my father. <sighs> I never thought of him as one. And yet, he was every bit apparent. Apparent to me as the ones in my previous life. Break time. <laughs> Break time. Break time. Break time. He thought and thought, cried and cried until he was exhausted. I don't want to do anything. He finally sees him as a father. Ugh. I, yeah, that's, um, 
such a significant change. Now, that, that's kind of what I was mentioning in the last chapter or last Mystical Monday is this idea of, I, I hope this changes his perspective on family. And it seems like it is. I think he's still got a ways to go with Zenith, for sure. But at least with Paul... He's, he's pretty much had it. Like I said, with the displacement incident and everything that's happened, he, he's relearning what he lost. He's gained two sisters. And now he's gained a father. Unfortunately, he lost his father, but he gained him at the same time. He realized he was my father. That's my father. Paul was my father. That line hurt me so bad. Too late, but still important still important that he gets that aspect. It's important for everybody to have at least experienced, even if it's not your blood-related father. In this case, it technically is, but again, the circumstances makes it really jumbled. It's a jumbled mess. But at least he acknowledged it. At least he ex has experienced what it's like to be a father, because that's important for him, when he has his child, to understand what a father is, to understand what a father would go through, to understand how important... It is to be a father. Oof. So huge. Such a huge... Just four four freaking words. And it's so huge. Oh, It is such a... Such an important thing. Oh, Rudius lounged lazily about his room. Even with things to do, he couldn't find the will to do them. He's become a shut-in again right back to where he was before. The reasoning for why is different, but the impact is still there. Something happened. Some event happened that just broke him to the point where he doesn't want to get involved with anything. All he wants to do is sit there. It's easier, so much easier just to sit there. Annalise and Lilia came by to visit in the midst of this. They said things, but none of it registered. It was as if they were speaking a foreign language. Not that it mattered, he wouldn't be able to reply. He had nothing to say. No words to speak to them. And there was a side of me that was almost wondering if this was going to be like this point where Rudius breaks and his mind is in the past, his previous life, and thus he doesn't even know the language of the world anymore. That would have been really weird, but they didn't do that. Maybe if I was skilled with a sword, able to chop off a Hydra's head, maybe Paul wouldn't have to die. Here, here it starts. I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. He was going to sit here and think about what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. The two of them working on chopping heads off as Roxy roasted the open wounds. It would have been easy to defeat it, right? If only he could wrap himself in battle aura. If only he was faster. Then Paul wouldn't have had to shield him. Maybe if they had gone back to the city. I knew this was going to be one of them. What if we went back to the city? Just, just drag Paul back. They could have had a strategy meeting and come up with a solid plan. A smart one. Not a clumsy one. This was my plan. This was a clumsy plan. I, this was my plan. This is my fault. If they did anything just a bit differently, the outcome might have changed. But it was too late. Paul was dead. He'd never get to see him again. Just like his parents of his previous life. No matter what he said now, it was already too late. Oh, this chapter, <laughs> these chapters suck. That is chapter 10. Again, like I said, I knew, I knew this was coming. I knew he was going to sit here and just, what if, what if, what if, what if. Chapter 11, looking ahead. Can we do that? Can we have a light at the end of the tunnel, please? Uh, I'm sure this chapter is extremely controversial. Um, I don't even really know my thoughts on it. it. I'm very mixed, but we'll we'll get to that. At a certain pub, Geese, Elise, Talhan, and Roxy sat with darkness settling over them. Paul's dead. Yeah, sure is. He protected his boy. That's how he'd once have gotten. Don't think he'd be happy. Not with Zenith like that. It was a shock to them all that Zenith turned out to be an empty husk. Still, they were adventurers. Death had always been close at hand. They would have had the capacity to accept it even if she had died. She's alive, right? Who knows? Maybe she could be healed. He said that without much hope in his voice. There were stories occasionally of people being crippled by monster poison. Never a story of recovering. Once the mine was gone, nothing could heal them. Not even God-tier healing magic. That's interesting. Again, this goes back to my whole thing about before. 
you would assume that healing, which technically reverses time if you think about it, restores tissue, restores it back to normal, makes it whole, you would think that with a high enough tier of healing, you could restore a mind. But you would also think there's probably an aspect of time as well. If somebody has a huge gash, maybe at some point you can't heal it. And since she's been in there for that long, there's no telling when her mind went completely gone. And I'm also kind of curious as to how that happened. She was displaced like everybody else. When Marius got displaced over into the demon continent, it's not like he lost his mind. The assumption is that it's just the pure traumatic experience of being placed inside of that gym that messed her up. Even if she's able to somehow walk and talk again, her memories won't return. Sure are talking like you know a lot about the matter, Ellen Elise. I'm just telling like it is. Ellen Elise lived a long time, longer than Talhan and Geese. She had seen similar cases before. It was likely that she did know something, but whatever it was, it wasn't gonna give them any hope. So Talhan didn't press her further. Again, I think she was telling the truth back there. When Roxy brought up the idea of, well, once it's destroyed, I've heard of cases of it just melting, a liquefying. So we'll be able to get her. And then Ellen Elise followed up by saying, yeah, I, I have a friend that had that happen to them and they're up and walking right now. Maybe that actually happened. Maybe she did know somebody that was in a crystal. Maybe she even knew what was gonna happen in the end. She knew Zenith possibly would be a husk. I'll have to go back when that was stated. I wonder if she had, I wonder if at some point after they discovered her, if there was a point where Ellen Lace looked a certain way. I don't think so, but it would be telling if that was the case. The real problem is the boy. Yeah. Geese let out a sigh. It's not like that kid's under the weather. It goes deeper than that. It's almost like he's a husk too. Rius never responded whenever they talked to him. Just vacant eyes and simple yes. Rudy was very attached to Mr. Paul. Roxy pictured young Rudius taking sword lessons from Paul. No matter how Paul beat him into the ground, Rudius would stand back up and continue swinging with an indignant look on his face. He was the embodiment of talent. To Roxy, he looked like he truly was enjoying learning from his father. Oof. <laughs> Oof. I... It's sort of one of those things where I'm mixed because on one hand, it could be that Roxy is misinterpreting Rudeus' perspective. She's seen Rudeus being like this and was like, he's having fun. He likes learning from his father. Well, on the other hand, Rudeus himself is just, he wanted to beat Paul. He really wanted to beat Paul. He actually, at some point, mentioned the idea that he wanted to get skilled enough to beat Paul before Paul lost his prime, basically. He wanted to prove himself to Paul. But there's always this aspect of the outsider's perspective. Similar to the cold case with Sylphie. When Sylphie was mentioning like Rudeus' legs shaking and stuff like that when he was helping her out, this idea of somebody being terrified of what other people's, when other people look at him, it's that different perspective from what we've always had from Rudeus, suddenly seeing what other people seen. And I almost wonder if it's true right here. Maybe Rudeus himself in his own mind wasn't wanting to admit it, but he was having fun learning from his father. And Roxy's seen that. But Roxy's seen this, it was a blinding source of envy to her, given she had never shared such moments with her parents. But you did. <laughs> you did, girl. You did. It was your mother and father sitting there teaching you how to talk with normal tongue. They knew that you couldn't talk to anybody, so they taught you how to talk to people. They trained you. And yes, based on the anime adaptation, it looked like she was having fun doing it. Well. I understand how the boss feels, but it's gonna be bad if things stay this way. I must agree. Rudius wasn't eating, even if they pressed him to. He was at least doing the minimum of at least drinking water, but he was growing more gaunt by the day. His eyes were sunken in and his cheeks were hollow, looking like he had the shadow of death on his face. Everyone thought he would soon join Paul. I'd like to do something for him to try to cheer him up. Geese turned to Ellen Elise. Didn't you always say it was important to get lucky in times like this? I can't help him with getting lucky. Roxy was the only one that didn't understand what they were talking about. <laughs> She's so pure. The goddess is too pure. What, what is it you can't do? Geese and Talhan exchanged looks and pursed their lips. Roxy furrowed her brow in suspicion. Miss Ellen Lace, do you have some kind of plan? No, I don't. The elf maintained her poker face. Well, how, how should I put it? Um, well, in times like these, it's just best to enjoy yourself to the fullest and try to forget. And enjoy yourself? Men are straightforward. Give them some alcohol, a woman to bed, and they'll get that rush of joy from being alive. Bring a little bit of energy back to them. Um, I mean, yeah, it's not gonna return them to how they were, but still. Ah, uh, all, all right, I get it now. W well, I guess you're right. <laughs> it's like it finally dawns on her. <laughs> well, I, I guess you're right, but 
that that's just how men are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> her cheeks flushed red and her gaze floated to her lap. Men liked to bed women when they were depressed. She was sure she had heard that story once before. Mercenaries that would pay for women to distract them from the fears of their battle. But when Roxy thought about Rudius and Elise together, a dark cloud hung over her heart. If only she knew what well, she's gonna find out here in a minute, honestly. Elise, you've always said, for as long as I can remember, that you're good at consoling men with wounded hearts. I have. Roxy knew Elise had a talent for that type of thing. Surely, with her skill, she could get Rudius back on his feet. The thought of that made her gloomy. But what else could they do? How unusual. Normally you would be all over someone in that kind of state bosses in right now. Roxy couldn't stand seeing Rudius the way he was now. Elise felt the same, wanted to help him, console him. But she also knew what would happen when they returned home. This is hitting heavy on Elise's past. Again, everywhere she went, she caused destruction. That's why she was so broken down when she finally made that connection with Sylphie. I destroy everything. Rudius, don't look at her as if she's me. She's different. Don't run away from her. She doesn't want to destroy what she now has. And she's afraid she's going to do that. But she also knew that what would happen when they returned home. She would be betraying Cliff and Sylphie. Even Rudius wouldn't be able to cope with that. She's even more afraid of him having to deal with Sylphie, hating him, or even Cliff as well. She can take it. I think she's afraid of doing that, obviously. She doesn't want to break this thing that she has. But she is more afraid for other people. She's more afraid of destroying what's there. She's used to it. She's destroyed so many things before. She's numb to it. But even still, she's afraid of it. She's changed so much. Even I have people I can't bed. What? Why not Rudy? Roxy's lips hardened. She fixed Ellen Lace with a glare. You know how much she's suffering? Because Ellen Lace paused, remembering Roxy didn't know yet. Because the person he married, his wife, is my granddaughter. Roxy was shocked. Her cup dropped, spilling everywhere and hitting the ground. What? Rudy's married? Yes, he is. And his child will be born soon. Oh, oh, so it's true. Well, well I mean, of course it is. Rudy's, Rudy's at that age already. <laughs> That's hurt. She finally finds out. After all this time, she finally finds out. Ugh, Roxy girl. Roxy girl. I, uh, my heart broke. Finally, <laughs> finally gets told. Roxy couldn't mask how shooken she was, lifting her tankard off the ground and attempting to drink from it. She then called for another drink, the strongest one they had. Her eyes swiveled as she folded her arms over her chest. Marriage, of course. It was normal. The thought of how she acted in the labyrinth made her grit her teeth. The advances she had made on him. Thinking he was single, he was receptive of her at a level that she had never experienced before. But perhaps he didn't reject her because they were acquaintances. From the sidelines, it must have looked hysterical. The most entertaining buffoonery. Girl is like, <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> she wanted to scream out loud. Why didn't anybody tell me? But it remained lodged in her throat. Anyhow, her feelings weren't what mattered right now. I like this. Acknowledging that this isn't what's important. Back to the point at hand. Back to what is pretty much the issue right now. Rudius. So still, even if he's married, this is an emergency. Couldn't you both be forgiven for doing it just once? She didn't even understand the words that she was speaking. <laughs> it's like over here, she's like, wait, no, I don't want to see Ellen Lace with him. That's bad. And then over here, she's like, wait, okay, he's married. That That is bad. And then over here, she's just blurting it out like we need to fix the situation. Like she's returned back to that core point that Rudy is stuck and he's going to die. Again, they're acknowledging, give it a couple more days, he could be dead. And this is where we're getting that really massive struggle. And it's something I was even talking about way back here with Ellen Lace and her curse. That idea of jokes aside, there is an actual physical impact that this is creating. Putting aside the shipping wars, there is an actual physical impact here. What would you do? You kind of, you don't have a choice sometimes. And that's what they're sort of creating with this. Yes, they can find another way. They're just defaulting on what Ellen Lace has said can fix a man. It not necessarily has to be the only option. They could just drag him back home and hopefully Sylphie can fix him. But they would have to travel without his aid. And they need him. But yes, Roxy just felt strongly about helping Rudius back up. She's willing to compromise. Even though it's not her getting impacted by this, honestly, if you think about it. Perhaps, but I can't be the one to do it. Ellen Lace said woefully. Roxy couldn't understand the emotion in her voice. Or her visible frustration. 
there's like two sides of this I see right here. Is this one side of Elise going like, I you're asking me to do something I don't want to do. I am not that simple minded. Yes, she has to sleep, and yes, she does enjoy sleeping for the people for her curse. But this is something she does not want to destroy. Plain and simple. But there's another side of it that I think that she's like, girl, you go do it. <laughs> I know you want to do it. Go do it. Like, wake up, Roxy. <laughs> wake up, Roxy. You have this opportunity right now. Uh, it's totally in Elise's mind. She knows that Roxy wants it. The server arrived with Roxy's drink. She gulped it down in one go. It spread through her body like a wildfire. It probably tastes delicious because her body was craving it. Besides, Reese and I have already... Elise paused, then pursed her lips. Well, even though I can't help, geese can drag him off to a brothel or something, right? What was that statement? Ruiz and I have already made a promise that they wouldn't do that or done it. We do know that at some point when she was basically huffing and puffing way back here, but he still had his ED, he did everything that he could do besides use that. And that was the only way that he could possibly get her to not have that curse overtake her. I guess that could probably be it. We've done something, but I think it's probably the promise. Not sure about that. You really think Rudius would cheer up by having sex with some girl he doesn't know? Well, what he needs right now is to be able to lean on someone that he trusts. <laughs> it's like, nudge, nudge, Roxy. <laughs> so, Lilia? Ellie shot a glare at Geese. This is exactly... <laughs> She's like literally going, Geese, shut up. I'm trying to, I'm trying to nudge this girl right here. Shut up. Um, but no, I think right there she's saying probably like that Lilia right now is not a good thing. Let's not venture into that territory right now. I think Lilia, knowing that that could fix Rudy, she would probably be willing to. I fully think that Lilia will be perfectly willing to, to bed Rudius. I don't think she has a problem with that at all. I think again, I think Lilia does see herself as a motherly figure to Rudius, not as a mother. But I also think there is an aspect of servitude that she'd be willing to do anything for Rudius. Okay, okay, I get it. Don't get so pissy. Elise's feelings were complicated. She didn't want to intrude on Rudius' marriage to Sylphie, but she did want to help Rudius. If she bedded him, she can get him back on his feet. Elise was confident about that. This wasn't the first time or even a second time. She was in a situation like this where she helped a man heal the wounds of his heart. But she couldn't help to think that it would be a disastrous choice that she couldn't take back. Again, she didn't want to destroy everything like she always does. She was conflicted. Normally, she didn't mind being the one to get her hands dirty. She played that role multiple times. But her desire to not betray Cliff got in the way. She simply couldn't do it. I like that. Normally, again, this is that whole aspect of destroying everything she goes. Normally, she was willing to do this kind of stuff. Normally, if she's seen this situation, okay, I can fix it by doing this. Everybody's going to hate me, but at least I'll fix this situation. I'll get my hands dirty. I'll be the bad guy, basically. I'll be the one that destroys everything around me, and then when I walk away, they'll be fine. But at least they'll be fine. I'll walk away because I, I'm, I'm the bad guy. She's done that before. And she's normally okay with that. But now is different. Because now I don't want to dirty my hands in front of Cliff. Cliff is that important to her. I love it. I love getting more and more insight that the fact that Ellen Lace, this isn't a joke to her. Cliff isn't a joke to her. Cliff isn't a fling. Cliff isn't just cute. Oh man, he just captured my heart. And we, 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 we go at it and then I'll walk away. No, she really does love him. There was a long silence. Anyways, we got Zenith in a state she's in right now too. I want to get the boss back on his feet as quick as possible so we can hightail it out of this town. Everyone sighed. Yeah, I don't disagree. Everyone was exhausted. After all, it had been six years since the displacement incident. We're finally getting into this aspect. I was kind of hitting on it in the last Mishoka Monday, or it was like two Mishoka Mondays ago now. Um, this, the, how much sacrifice these people have gone through. And I, I unfortunately always forget to talk about, yes, I do acknowledge the idea that they're doing this for Zenith too. This isn't just for doing it for Paul. They are doing this for Zenith. I understand that. It's just I always kind of take it from perspective of who's in the room at the moment. And that's kind of where it kind of takes my mindset. But yes, it's been six years since the displacement incident. A substantial period of time during which they traveled the Central Continent, the Demon Continent, and Begarant Continent. Even venturing into the teleportation labyrinth. It was intense, rough going, and they labored through it all. Both the good 
and the bad times, with hope of coming out laughing together when it was over. <laughs> oh, damn it, brothers in arms. The displacement incident had been an unpleasant affair, but the time they spent together hadn't been completely awful. Their broken, disconnected party had slowly come back together. They just needed Ghislaine, and they had the whole party, and it ends in tragedy. That's what sucks. They wanted to all cheer in a bar together, drinking drinks, being merry, celebrating we did it. And I think even if Zenith came out of that a husk, there would still be celebrations at some point. But unfortunately now it's, it's ending is on a note of losing two members technically. Elise and Talhan had teamed up while Geese hopped into action for Paul. Paul and Talhan had reconciled the differences. Paul and Elise even fought side by side once more at the very end. None of them had ever dreamed that they would come back together like this, but there they were with Paul in the center, the party back together. All they had to do was rescue Zenith and then locate Ghislaine wherever she wandered off to. <laughs> I, I, I that, was, that was an interesting line because I assumed at some point they got note that Ghislaine was back at the refugee camp or something. But it, yeah, at this point, they don't even know where she's at. They just assume she's displaced too. They have, they have no record of where she's at. Then they could all share drinks together. That's what they all thought. But now Paul was dead. Stop with that line. <laughs> over and over again, they gotta remind me, I know. It was enough to overwhelm them with an indescribable sense of exhaustion. Like it was all for naught. That's what sucks. In the end, it feels like failure. Even though, like what Paul said, no matter what happens, at least we're done. At least it's over now. Rudius wasn't the only one overcome with lethargy. Don't be so glum. Rudius is Paul's boy. Might be down in the dumps right now, but he'll pick himself back up on his own eventually. No doubt. I certainly hope you're right. Elise and Geese nodded vaguely. They both knew Rudius' weakness, but he was already 16. He wasn't a child anymore. It was grim, but he was remarkable. There's that expectations. Always setting expectations for Rudius because he does incredible stuff. Death visited everyone, especially adventurers. Everyone's parents died eventually. Everyone had to deal with this at some point in their lives. That's why they assumed Rudius would just be able to do the same. While they all nodded, Roxy did not, preoccupied by her memories from long ago. Back to Rudius. Just jump into it. <laughs> just, just jump into it. Oh, there's so much in this segment. Oh, this is a long chapter. This is a long chapter. Rudius realized it was evening when he looked out the window. Spacing out, he wondered how many days went by, or if it even mattered. Suddenly, a knock came at the door. Rudy, can I have a moment? It was Roxy. She stood at the door. He didn't even know if he left the door open. Teacher, he spoke after a long pause. It felt like ages since he had spoken. His voice was hoarse. Roxy hastily made her way towards him. Something was different. Then he realized she wasn't wearing her usual robe. Her shirt and pants were pieces of thinly woven fabric. A rare sight. Pardon me. She swiftly plopped down on the bed beside him. Several seconds of silence passed before Roxy spoke slowly. It was as if she was choosing her words carefully. Want to go out somewhere with me for a bit? For a change of pace? Huh? Uh, th there's so many magical items in the city that you wouldn't be able to see in other continents. It might be interesting to go look at them all, don't you think? No, I'm not in the mood right now. Oh, oh, you're not. Sorry. He knew that she was just trying to cheer him up. Normally, he would follow her like a puppy, but he just simply didn't feel like that right now. Silence filled the room. Yes, Rudy, you're supposed to follow her every command. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, it's it's kind of technically a funny sign of how broken Rudy's is when he doesn't just like bark at the moment that she says something. And here's where it hurts. This part hurts. Roxy spoke up. It's unfortunate what happened with Mr. Paul and Miss Zenith. Unfortunate? Rudius thought, was that really something that can simply be summed up in one word? Well, it wasn't her family after all. I can still remember in great detail, the five of us living together in Buena Village. That might've been the happiest time of my life. Roxy spoke quietly, her warm hands gripping his. As an adventurer, it's not unusual for people close to you to die. I know the pain I've experienced before. Please don't lie to me. Rudius met Roxy's parents. He knew they were alive. She might not have seen them for a while, but surely that hadn't changed. Your mother and father are doing just fine, aren't they? That's true. It's been a few years since I saw them, but they seem well. I'm sure they still have a hundred years ahead of them. Then you don't understand. A wave of emotion flooded up in his chest as he batted her hand away. How dare you, Rudius? I was so mad at this point. Like, Rudius, damn it, Rudius. Don't you touch her. 
<laughs> so mad. Oh, man. Don't throw around that word so casually. The last bit of his strength drained from him as he yelled at her. But again, that goes back to that whole discussion I keep having. And I had it before with, with Zenoba, and I had it here recently in this chapter. This idea of claiming that you understand somebody. That you understand what they're going through. I like how she sort of clarifies it. It's just, it's never going to be one for one. And it's it's always two-sided. Like I've said it before, I am always afraid of saying I understand what people are going through. Because in truth, you can never 100% understand what somebody's going through. You can only claim that you you have an idea, really. It's a better word. I have an idea what you're going through. I have a sense. I have I have similarity issues here. And I sort of, I get where you're coming from. On the opposite end, it's, it, and it's hard to feel rational at that point when you're full of sorrow or, or, or some sort of pain to understand that people intend well when they say that. They're not saying that you're on equal terms and you should, you should be sorry for them too because they understand what you're going through. It's not that intent. It's trying to find and console you. And yet it sucks that when you're in that state, you almost feel like you're trying to search for anything to prove that you'll never understand me. It's like you gotta win in your own mind. It's It sucks. The person who died was someone who formed a party with me and taught me the basics right after I became an adventurer. I wouldn't go so far as to call him a parent, but I did think of him as an older brother. He died shielding me. I don't know if they ever mentioned that before. Would that have been Hawkendale? Because Blaze and Nokopata were still alive. I think it would have been Hawkendale. Like you, I was also anguished over his death. Of course, I don't think that as bad as what happened to you, losing a father and finding your mother to be sick, but it did leave me deeply depressed. That's why I think I can understand a little bit, even if it's just a sliver of what you're feeling right now. Rhea's thought, she didn't understand how he felt. Having reincarnated, stuck between past and present, he wasn't just saddened over Paul's death, nor was he just simply lamenting over Zenith becoming a husk. He'd realized something. Ever since he was reincarnated, here's where it gets so much deeper, so much deeper. <laughs> Ever since he was reincarnated, he decided to do it all over again. He thought he was doing a good job, this time, this time I'm gonna do it right, right? This time, everything's gonna be perfect. It's gonna be a great life. But in the end, he just ignored something important. He turned his back on the discord between him and his family in his previous life. This was literally like him getting in a plane and flying off to somewhere else. Get away from it all. I don't even wanna talk to my family anymore. Block them on my phone, escape it. He kept averting his eyes, even after being reborn. As a result, he'd make the same mistake a second time in this world. Made the same mistake a second time in this world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Yes, 100%. He's acknowledging that literally, I did the same thing. Again, sorry for everybody here that I repeat this. Previous life, had that incident in school, shut himself up in his room, rejected his parents, rejected his family, rejected his brother, hid away, didn't want to have anything to do with anybody. Eventually, to the point of being disconnected so much from his family, his parents and everything, didn't want to have anything to do with them. They died, didn't even go to their funeral. He made this, this, this claim that the reason he didn't do it is because he didn't want everybody looking at him and, and judging him, but he didn't want to go. That was an excuse. He didn't want to go anyways. He had no feelings for them. Reincarnated. Great. Second time. Second chance. Let's do it great this time. I'm going to have the best life ever. Completely ignored his parents. He could have experienced being a child to parents. He could have experienced having a father. He could have experienced having a mother. But he ignored them all. This was his second chance, and he did the same damn thing. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Ugh. That was an interesting realization point I didn't even think was coming. Like, I wasn't even expecting this right here. He'd been unable to give anything back to his parents before Paul died. And Zenith became a husk. He did the same thing all over again. Repeated the same mistakes. One he couldn't take back. That's the sucky part. No, he technically still has one, and he could do whatever he can for that one, but he missed his opportunity for the other one. He did fulfill the other one's wish. 
And I think that's important. His previous 34 years and his current 16, 50 years he had lived for in total and yet done it again. He was hopeless in his previous life, but now thinking he could change, he was confronted with reality that nothing had changed. While it looked good on the surface, then truth, he'd hardly budged past square one. He's still back at the starting point. Getting back on his feet seemed hopeless. Knowing that Roxy had processed a similar experience and managed to get back on hers did little to reassure him. And there is the other aspect of that whole thing. No matter if somebody says, I understand what you're going through, it doesn't suddenly make it all go away. And especially since the fact that he has no clue what she's going through, unfortunately, because he won't open his damn mouth. It's just a two-sided coin here. I was truly happy during my days in Buena Village. I originally came to the Osprey Kingdom wanting to work there, but I couldn't find any jobs. I decided to take a temporary position in the countryside as a home tutor. But then you were overflowing with talent and Paul and Zenith treated me so warmly. I think they were the ones that originally taught me what the kindness, true kindness of a family is. Girl, every time you talk like this, it hurts. <laughs> Your parents love you. But again, this shows why Roxy did all this. I talked about that previously. This is why Roxy went through all this. It wasn't just for Rudy. Again, he was at the lowest point of the priority list. She experienced a family with them. Again, celebrated birthdays and everything. She looked at him, her soft, warm eyes. They were like a second family. She stood up on his bed, slipped behind him, knelt, and wrapped her arms around his head as if cradling him. Rudy, I think... I think I can share in your sadness. He felt something soft pressed against the back of his head. He could hear the gentle pulse of her heart, a soothing sound. Why did it come for him so? He wondered. Why did it make him feel like things would be okay? Puzz, it's a goddess Roxy. I really still think there's something else here, especially with the whole, again, the labyrinth going down and rescuing her. Her scent was relaxing. Up until now, when he faced difficulty, it had been strangely comforting to remember this smell and the things that she had taught him. When in grips of his ED, just thinking of Roxy had been enough to help him endure. Why was that? The answer hung in the back of his throat and refused to come out. You loved her? <laughs> you love her? Obviously you love her. I, I think that's probably what was in the back of his throat, but that's true. That is technically true. There's always been something about Roxy that has always comforted him. Yes, and I think a lot of that has to do with his, the initial experience that he had with her, that she showed him the world taught him the world, and then showed him the world. That's always been with him. He's always been in love with her. Because again, it's this odd aspect of the fact that when he met Roxy, he wasn't technically a child. He was an adult. He was still a man-child, but he still was an adult, so he could know what love is. But it's after everything she did for him, she became the first thing that... he was. She was technically the first thing in this world that he truly attached to. Again, because he never had love for Paul, Zenith, Lilia, anybody. It was Roxy that he first became attached to because she opened his eyes. I'm your teacher. And though I'm small and inadequate, I have lived longer than you and I'm tough. I don't mind if you lean on me. No, you're technically about the same age. <laughs> he took hold of one of her hands. It was small, yet felt so big. Just looking at it, brought him comfort. He wondered if that sense of relief would grow stronger if he got closer. I'm sure that even when things are tough, you can lessen the burden by splitting it with someone else. Roxy pulled away, but he drew her back by instinct. She panicked as she fell onto his lap. Their faces were close and eyes met. Her eyes were sleepy, moist with tears. I wonder how long she's been crying. Her face red and lips tightly shut. He put his hands on her back, guiding her close. Her heart was thundering furiously, and she felt warm. We can do it, she stuttered. Do what, he thought. I, I mean, I hear that a man's heart feels lighter when he takes a woman to bed. Ruiz thought, who the heck said that? Ah, uh, Elise. <laughs> Ella Elise. <laughs> it's always her. Just what was that elf telling Roxy at a time like this? Roxy spoke so fast, her words jumbled together. Women feel the same. Then things are tough, they want something to make them forget. I'm also devastated by Mr. Paul's death. So if you want to do it, I don't mind if you take me to bed with you. That's that's right. I, I want you to help me forget. But my body's kind of plain. If, if you're interested, you could go to a brothel instead. He had an immense respect for her, just as she was. 
What would it be like if he did what she suggested? Anyways, I might not look like it, but I'm quite experienced. I'm sure I can perform much better than any girl you would find in the streets. Just think it as a casual thing, a way to wash away the bad, as a way to test out things, just once. Her incoherent explanations were lost on him, but he still found himself invested. If her heart was this soothing to listen to, how much relief would he find if their bodies pressed together? His mind lingered on that excuse as she babbled. Uh, uh, well, if you're really particular about being with someone who is skilled, maybe you can bow your head to Miss Ellen Lace. He pushed her down on the bed, roughly, violently. Maybe he just had frustration to spare. The next morning, the first thing to greet him was Roxy's face. Well, <laughs> that happened. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's why all the Sylphie fans hate me. <laughs> I guess this is why all the Sylphie fans hate me. I'm kind of curious at this point. Is, I, I, again, I don't really like to look into fandoms. I don't like to look too much into things because I'm always afraid of running into spoilers. But it's like, because I probably would have seen this. But there's a side of me that kind of wonders, do Sylphie fans really hate Roxy because she was the first one to, to break his relationship with Sylphie? <laughs> like, I, I get it. Again, I don't think Sylphie's going to, I mean, she's going to be crushed. But I don't think, she said she's okay with it. Like, she wants whatever Rudeus wants. And I think in this situation, if Sylphie were to find out, okay, Rudeus is literally going to die. He's going to crawl up in a ball and die. We can't get him back home. He's going to become dead. Like, he's literally going to starve. We need to do something. This is the only plan we got. Um, he needs to sleep with somebody. He's going to sleep with Roxy, the one that he admires the most. Is that okay? She'd probably be like, you know, it hurts. But if he'll survive, I and it's Roxy, it's fine, I guess. I don't think she would mind in that situation, but there is still a side of me that, like, wonders, is everybody... Because Andrew loves Roxy so much, and he had unkind words to say about Sylphie for quite a few chapters, is that why everybody hated me so much? <laughs> I have this right here as I'm talking bad about Sylphie, and they're like, yeah, he's the one that likes that... That thieving cat that went off and stole Rudius after he got married to Sylphie. I'm super mixed about this, by the way. As I've stated before, my mindset has been, I didn't think Roxy was a good match for Rudius. But I am not Roxy. I am not Rudius. I am just an outsider's perspective, seeing what I see and thinking what I think. It's all dependent on the characters themselves. What they're going to choose to do what mistakes they will make, and what decisions they'll make. And in this moment, Roxy is terrified she's going to lose Rudeus. And she loves Rudeus. And Ellen Lace presents an option. We can fix him this way. She's not a doctor. She doesn't know all the options. She doesn't know what to do. Ellen Lace proposed this. I'll try it. If this will fix him, I will take that burden off his shoulders. Even knowing he's married. If Just, just, do, just do this and we'll take care of it and we'll move on. Deal with the repercussions later. At the same time, Sylphie fans take note here. It does frustrate me the idea that Rudeus is not faithful to Sylphie. This does frustrate me. I even said that with the whole thing with Ellen Lace. I'm like, yeah, I mean, if they're out in the middle of nowhere and the curse is getting her, he's gonna have to do something. But even then, it's, it's, it's a struggle. Yes, me personally, I'm upset at the idea of Rudeus sleeping with Roxy. Yes, there's a side of me that is the one that loves Roxy so freaking much and I want her to have what she wants. Yes, I'm happy for Roxy. I'm happy that she gets to sleep with Rudeus. But you know what? I think in this moment, it's not a victory for Roxy. It's not her getting what she wants. It's her saving Rudeus. That's what's important. That's all she cares about. It's like the whole earlier point of this chapter was when she's thinking about all this other stuff and she's like, but that's not important right now. What's important right now is Rudeus is going to die. He's not eating. All he's doing is barely drinking. He's becoming a husk. His cheeks are hollow. His eyes are sunken. He is going to die. Unless we go in there and we force food down his throat and somehow make him not barf it up, we need to do something. It was more than just her going in there to fix him. It was her going in there to state, I will carry your burden. I will take upon my shoulders 
your burden. Let me help you. What did Rudius say when he first went to go see Zenith and Zenith woke up? Finally, the three of us in this room, we will mourn together. We will cry about Paul's death together. Together, we will grieve. What is Roxy basically saying here? She wants to grieve with him. There's more family here than you think. I am family. I went to Blaina Village. I met your family. I treasured those moments together. Not just that. Those were the best moments of my life. That period of time was the best moment of my life. She's seen them as family. Rudy, I'm family. Let me carry some of that weight. Let me lift that weight off of your shoulder. That's what is important here. It's not a win. It's not anything else. And that's the struggling thing is because it's the aftermath that where you, where you really start thinking about all that other stuff. It's just like Ellen Lease. Ellen Lease literally does this all the time. She knows what happens. Before, several times before, Ellen Lease has experienced men with broken hearts and she knew that she can fix them if they just she just beds them. And she's really good at it. But she knows that it's her getting her hands dirty because of what happens afterwards. That's always what we see. With this situation, it's not Roxy stealing Rudius away from Sylphie. It's Roxy seeing Rudius is going to die, step in, handle the situation, and then deal with the repercussions afterwards. Dirty your hands, deal with the repercussions later. Because afterwards is when you're going to think about all the other stuff. The, oh crap, I wasn't faithful to Sylphie. Oh crap, what is she going to think? How am I going to explain this? That's where all the repercussions come from. But yes, putting all that aside, am I happy for Roxy? Yes, damn straight I am. She got what she, again, I don't think this was in her mind at the time. She got with the guy that she loves so much. I think that's a great thing. I am super happy for Roxy. I want to celebrate, but this is the, <laughs> this is the sucky thing. I can't celebrate because that's not the point of the whole scene. <laughs> I can't cheer and go, yeah, yeah, best girl one. She slept with them. At this point, Rodius has slept with all three starter Pokemon. We got them all. We got Charmander, we got Bulbasaur, and we got Squirt Squirtle. He's bagged all the starter Pokemon. Ash Ketchum's ready to go out to the and get all the badges. He's got all the Pokemon. Um, yeah, I want to celebrate that Roxy got got with him. And that's technically. Technically, I, st I say this, but this is the case with every one of them. The first time he slept with Edis, what was the circumstances? Edis had just learned she lost her whole family. And she was trying to, to lock down Rudius. She didn't want Rudius to leave her too. It's a terrible position to be in for a night together. Silphy, he was broken. He was unable to perform. He was terrified of someone else leaving him. He got fired up with some some uh, some Luke juice and got going. Roxy, he's mourning the death of his parents and he's going to whittle away and die. And he slept with her. Every, every, every one of them is not a pristine situation. Every one of them is not like massively romantic. It's always a situation of cause and effect, technically. It sucks. It sucks every time. Roxy did the same thing to Rudius as Sylphie did to Rudius. They both seen him broken and they wanted to fix him. And that's what sucks. It's never just a random choice. It's never romantic. It's always sort of forced in a way. Now, granted, Rudius following the whole situation with Sylphie had plenty of more times where they got to have it and not have to worry about what was the issue. But still, it, it, it is technically heartbreaking. So yes, the side of me is happy for Roxy. But I don't think it was a win. I don't think this is a win. This isn't her stealing Rudius away from Sylphie. This isn't her winning in the War of the Waifus. This is literally her trying to be family. Trying to be a loved one. Trying to help him. Trying to tell him, I am family. Let me carry some of that weight. I can't... She's not the same. She's literally telling him, Paul was like a father to me. And I've had somebody die shielding me. Yes, technically, she doesn't relate to him in regards to his regrets from his previous life. But at least she can relate to him in what happened here. There's so much. <laughs> this is so much in here. 
Ah, uh, this Mishoka Monday is turning out to be really, really long. And it gets only crazier. <laughs> it gets only crazier. But no, I, I love Roxy, and I love this moment with her. I, I think it was super sweet, despite the fact... It, you, you kind of have to put yourself in the mindset of the there and now. And it's very difficult to say that because, I guess I, like I said before, I don't like the idea of Rudeus uh, not being faithful to Sylphie. As much as people think I hate Sylphie, I still think he should be faithful to her. But putting it into the moment of the now really starts to force my perspective on what the decision making they make there. And it still sucks. But at the same time, I felt it necessary. Even though they could have found another option. Like dragging him down there or something like that. Dragging him back up to Sylphie. Even though they need his help. But still. You know, I have to kind of catch myself. Because I, I do want to make it perfectly clear that I don't think that Roxy is... Like coming here to steal Rudeus away from Sylphie. I really don't honestly believe that her intention here was for this end result. I think as we find out with what comes up next, yes, she technically does want to savor it, but I don't believe that she came there with the intention that this is what she wanted to do. I think Rudeus initiates this. I don't think that Roxy steals him away from Sylphie. Rudeus initiates this. Because this is obviously the question that comes up right now. <laughs> um, there's no going to be avoiding this. Was Rudeus unfaithful or did Roxy force herself upon him? We didn't read that Roxy went in there and grabbed it and shoved it up inside of her. She, she can't initiate this stuff. Rudeus is, yes, in a depressed state. And there's an argument of essentially taking advantage of somebody that's vulnerable. I don't think that's the case here. Rudeus tasted something and he wanted more of it. I feel comforted by her. I feel something special with her. The toxins are coming out of my system. I feel like I want more of this. He pulled her in. Well, if this is what you want, then take it. And what does he do? He thinks of a joke. Oh, who taught her this? Huh, it's gotta be Elnis. He's in a right mind. And then when Roxy even provides him other options, brothel, Elnis, he shoves her down. And yes, violently goes at it. Rudius chose this. This is what Rudius wanted. Roxy gave him many options and even comforted him, but this is what he chose in the end. I don't think this is something that I can blame anybody but Rudius. No, the thing I hate most about this is he defiled the goddess. How dare you, Rudius? You defiled the goddess? <laughs> oh, man. I know there's people like that. The next morning, the first thing to greet him is Roxy's sleeping face. She looked so innocent with her hair let down. At the same time, the thought that he had screwed up ran through his mind. Yep. <laughs> a sigh escaped, wondering how he was going to explain to Sylphie. Yet another thing for him to be concerned about. <laughs> Sucks though, it is the thought process that now I'm just worried about this. But for some reason, his vision felt clear. As if everything he'd anguished over had been a dream. There was still a weight that clung to him. But he didn't feel like rock bottom anymore. Why was this so effective? Because he performed the act associated with bringing life to the world? Had that eased his sadness over the loss of Paul? Maybe not. By having sex, he'd more or less pushed his problem to the side for now. Roxy's eyes fluttered open. Good morning, Rudy. She muttered as she averted her eyes. Uh, how was it? He couldn't lie. He was horribly rough with her. It seems like that's the case with every one of them. <laughs> Except for Edis. I don't know that he got the upper hand with her. He knew immediately the claim of being experienced was a bald-faced lie. Yeah, the girl was too pure. But he didn't let it bother him. For her part, Roxy had welcomed everything openly, even the pain. He was both grateful and remorseful. Complimenting her felt wrong, given that he was in love with Sylphie. Honestly, her body was a bit small and didn't quite fit his, but he'd be lying if he said it didn't feel good. It was true, even now, he felt relaxed. She's like a sponge of negativity. <laughs> Don't take that out of context. There was no reason to lie if it would hurt her. It was amazing. Roxy's face heated gradually. Th thank you, but no, that's not what I meant. By how was it, I meant, how is your heart feeling? Any lighter? <laughs> like that, she's like, no, it's, it's not, that's not why I did this. <laughs> that's not why I did this. <laughs> oh, that's what she meant. Whoops. It does. Then as repayment, I'd be happy if you put your arms around me. S sure. He did as requested, her skin soft, damp because of the sweat. Her drumming pulse was reassuring. Your arms sure are strong. Not much like a magician. I've been training. Her fingers traced his chest and his arm. The motion was so endearing, it threatened to sway his love for Sylphie. <laughs> she's, she's nagging her. Now we can talk about the thieving Neko part. 
I, again, I think it's like this part where she's first, you know, gets with him and beds him is really her trying to help him. And now it's her going, okay, now I need my payment. I almost wonder if this moment is Roxy going, let me just kind of savor this moment before I know he's going to go back to his wife. Because I we did this because I had to, but now I I kind of want to enjoy this for the moment before I, I basically say goodbye. He slowly peeled away from her and got up. Teacher, uh, could I ask you something? Something strange. There was a pause and then she responded. What is it? She must have read the room. Roxy's expression turned serious. Roxy gets serious? <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought that when I read it. The damn title, Roxy Gets Serious. She sat up and tucked her legs beneath her. Sitting up, she was completely naked. It was so sexy, stimulating, that he had to avert his eyes and cover his lower half <laughs> in order to continue the conversation. Roxy's perfect, obviously. Now here is, my gosh, the most interesting part of, I think, like the last <laughs> freaking five volumes, I don't know. This is a story of fiction, something I made up. He told her the tale of a man. When he was young, terrible things happened to him and he secluded himself. He lived purely on his parents' financial support for decades. Then one day, they died. The man didn't attend their funeral. No, he did the worst thing a person could possibly do. The other members of his family seen that and beat him senseless, drove him from his home. Although the man had nothing, he was lucky to find himself reborn in another world. He turned over a new leaf and began to mend his ways. Life was going smoothly, and he thought that he could be happy if things stayed that way. But he made a terrible mistake, and let someone precious to him die. It was then that the man recalled the death of his parents. Though it was late, he finally mourned their loss. That was a story. He literally told Roxy that he's a reincarnate. <laughs> literally told her everything. And it's so funny, he doesn't catch that she's onto it. The more he recounted, the more pent-up bile festering in his heart seemed to spill out. Maybe all he wanted was for someone to hear a story. This is like so great for him. He needed somebody to hear this because it's always been in there. This is who I was. I was a reincarnate. I was a terrible person, but he's never able to tell anybody that. He can't tell it. He can't admit it. He can't voice his concern. He can't vent. Now it all, like again, like you said, bile festering just kind of oozes out. Maybe it was really as simple as that. Roxy's becoming his therapist. <laughs> what do you think that man should do? She was quiet for a while. The story came out of nowhere. Maybe she was struggling with how to respond. He was sure that she didn't think the person in the story was him. Yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> she was clever. She might have guessed there was some sort of meaning behind it. If it were me, I would go visit my parents' graves. Even now, it's not too late. I'd also like to talk to the other family members. But the graves of those family members are so far away, the man can't go there easily. If he does go to see them, he may never be able to return. The man has a life of his own now. He's got a family in this new world and he wants to cherish them. That's where I think if anything, you're, that's, that's gonna click it, if anything, for Roxy. <laughs> so, he can't go back? No, there's a good chance that he couldn't go back even if he wanted to. Roxy fell silent again, this time briefer than the last. In that case, there's nothing to be done. All he can do now is cherish the family he has right in front of him. Her words were incredibly cliche. Anyone could have said the same or thought the same. They weren't special in the least. I hate this part because he's like, that's so cliche. Anybody could have said that. But he he does acknowledge later on that that's fine. It's cliche because it's the honestly the only answer you really have. There's no other answer. There's no deep thought process that you can spew out crazy rhymes and stuff. And here's where she pretty much says that she knows what he's talking about and he, does, he doesn't even acknowledge it. Even Paul would have wished for you to do the same, Rudy. She said it plainly, stating the obvious. Her words were trite platitudes, words he'd heard somewhere before. Please look to the future. Everyone's waiting for you. And yet hearing it made his heart feel as though a weight was lifted. Sometimes it is the most easiest response that is the right response. It wasn't that her words were commonplace. His death of his parents from this previous world, even Paul's death, they were inevitable events. All he could do was face and accept them. Yes, technically Paul's death is an eventuality. That's the unfortunate thing. He was, after all, alive in this world. Good point. Why, I mean, you can learn from that, but why worry about that you can't do anything with this? You're here now. This is your world. This is where you're alive. A world that continued on. He felt anxious knowing that he had to relay Paul's death and Zenith's disability to the others. He felt anxious about a future full of unknowns, but he couldn't run away. He had no idea what he should do, but all he could do was solve each issue, one after the other, one step at a time. 
This is what he decided to do ever since he found himself in this world, right? <laughs> Live life the fullest. Literally, you can still fulfill that promise. You'll fail, but you still can do what you said you were going to do from the beginning. He said that he failed that. No, you can still do it. Nothing's changed. So, he couldn't turn his eyes away. It is hard to stomach, but yes, technically the idea of living life to the fullest does mean the hardships. It's the goods, the bads. You're never going to go through all of your life with nothing but positives. And sometimes the negatives helps you grow and gives you experiences that makes you cherish other things more. Death makes you cherish life so much more. No matter what ordeals lay ahead of him, he would overcome them. He had to overcome them. Even though overcoming them wouldn't make the pain disappear entirely. It would just bring a degree of relief. It felt as if he had broken free from the chains that had been weighing him down. Teacher. Yes. Thank you. Roxy saved him once again. Roxy saved him once again. No amount of gratitude could ever repay her for that. Because Roxy best girl, fight me bros. Because <laughs> Roxy's freaking best girl. Yeah, that's that was kind of one of those aspects that really, that's the end of chapter 11 by the way. That's one of those aspects that I really did like about this whole segment is that element of, it's a reset. Rudy had a reset. Again, previous life, tragedy, locks himself up, eventually gets kicked out, dies. He's still a neat in this world. Coming into this world, he was still a shut-in. He would not, he barely left the house, and when he left the house, he would not leave the yard. He was stuck there. That property was his new apartment. He wouldn't leave it. Roxy comes along, teaches him the world, shows him the world, helps him come out of there. Then what happens? Tragedy happens again. He locks himself up. He's a shut-in again. Roxy comes in, carries his burden, brings him back out again. She literally saved his life a second time. Brought him back out of being a shut-in for a second time. And I really do think there is an element that they're trying to sort of introduce here. There's something special about Roxy. I still think there is. Again, but the whole thing with the labyrinth, him being able to figure out where she's at. I think there is some sort of connection between Rudius and her at this point. There has to be some sort of synchronizing that's happening. Their spirit, their their mana, something makes the two of them connect somehow. Really curious if they'll eventually ever get into what that is, but either way, what we sort of found here is that Roxy has sort of absorbed the vial that has been stuck in his heart, helped him release everything that has been pent up inside of him in regards to his frustrations, and yes, the burdens of his previous life. Back here at Buena Village, she released him from the locks of it. But here, she's releasing the, the pent-up mindset, the memories, the harshness that's in his mind that he has not been able to release. It's sort of like when you, when you don't speak about a problem you're having, it builds up. And it sort of happened here with his previous life. He's never been able to tell anybody this. The only person that he's ever really talked about is with the man god. But man god's not a good therapist. <laughs> Roxy's a good therapist. He, he finally has somebody he was able to tell it to. And it's so funny that still at the end of this chapter he never acknowledges it. At the very beginning when he first tells the story he's like, uh, did she figure it out? But then later in it she says, even Paul would have wished for you to do the same. She's not referring to this fictitious person. She knows it's Rudy. She knows he is not from this world now. This is the first person native to this world that knows that Rudy is a reincarnate. The first person that he is divulging this to is Roxy. <laughs> and I do wonder if there is a possibility that she knew that at some point. Maybe there was a hint in her mind that this boy isn't normal, obviously. He's acting different than what normal kids do. He's super genius, so he's got to have some sort of knowledge. It doesn't take too long for her to connect it. Him saying that story, it immediately clicked for her. Oh, yeah. Yep. It all makes sense now. Like, it, it all makes sense now. Not that it matters to her, um, but it all makes sense to her. She, she, this doesn't surprise her at all. This is Rudy. He's a genius kid. Now it all makes sense. That's why he's so smart. That's why he's a genius. And I'm curious if eventually we'll get another chapter with Roxy's inner thoughts, because I'm obviously going to want to know what was going through her head right here. 
But additionally, I almost want to know what she thinks now knowing that he is an isekai. No wonder he was a genius. It doesn't change the fact that she still appreciates him, but no wonder he's a genius. It all makes sense now. And I wonder if that will help her not come down on herself so much. Now it all makes sense. Now maybe me not being as good as him makes sense. There's a reason why he's so incredible. I don't think that will be the case because he doesn't know how long he was over there. And yes, technically they're kind of still in the same age area. Um, that's kind of the point that I've always made, the idea that Roxy's kind of the the one, the one choice of the Pokemon that isn't the, the most offensive out of all of them because she's technically that old, even though she has the body of a younger character and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's never okay for anybody. They're still going to find some reason to be angry about it. I am really curious where Rudius will take the situation with Zenith going forward because, like I mentioned before, having personally dealt with uh, dementia, it is a very, very difficult thing to handle because, again, the peop the person you love is... And again, it's different for Rudius because he hasn't made that connection with Zenith yet, so it'll probably be easier for him. There is still an element that despite the fact that they're not... They don't seem like they're there. There's still always the unknown of how much of them is still actually in there. And it is a very difficult thing to stomach. It is a very difficult thing to handle. Because you still want to hope that something is in there. That there there's a feeling that they're they're possibly trapped in there. And they do acknowledge you. They just don't know how to express it or at least put it to words. And so you still you, you get to a point where you just handle it as if they you assume that they are there. You still want to take care of them. You still want to help them. And there's a hope that something can recover. And again, technically with, with Zenith, we don't know the extent of it. We don't know if it's just completely damaged. Like there's no recovering from it. Her mind will never be the same. But there's still some cases where some damages how the brain works. If it's a damaging or something or just a removal of connections that you can have the brain through repetition and whatnot reconnect things. Um, I've dealt with people that have MS and with MS essentially you have scarring that removes the connections in the tissue in the brain but you can retrain it. You can if somebody loses an area that's for mobility you can technically retrain it by just moving again. It's just it's almost as if it's a reset. You have to retrain the brain to relearn things and give it new experiences so that it learns. And that might be a case for Zenith. Maybe she just needs to relearn these things and it could reestablish those connections that makes her a person again. That's the difficulty they're facing right now. They don't know what the extent is to the damage that has been done to her. I'm really curious as what Refugian's plan is for what happened to Zenith and can she recover? Or if it's going to simply be at least just make her comfortable. Whatever is there, still make it comfortable. Make her comfortable. There may still be something in Zenith there. Or if it's just going to turn into one of those things where Rudius talks to somebody that is extremely powerful, like, I don't know, Kishirika or somebody that knows some knowledge of the past that is a lost forbidden art, that could restore her. We don't know yet. I hope so. I ha I... I hope that Rudius has an option for himself that I personally didn't have. I would love that. Because that's something that I, again, I don't wish anybody ever experiences. But we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully best, best mom Zenith gets fixed. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, god dang, this was a long Mashuka Monday. And I was expecting this to be a short one. Uh, because I was expecting to be broken by the previous chapter and then not be able to get through much else but yeah chapter 11 is freaking hell along but yeah that's um that's all i've read so i'm gonna, obviously stopping here because of time as well but um yeah that's that's this mashuka mondays <laughs> um i thank you guys for so, so much for dropping by again sorry to have to watch me be a bumbling crying idiot but it is what it is uh again it's a lot of stuff that hits home for me personally um stuff that i just hate thinking about um, don't wish upon really anybody, but yeah, incredible two chapters for sure. Rudius being conflicted, falling down into desperation, being in need again, Roxy saving him, everybody's perspective on everything, just a whole bunch was in these chapters. And yes, the possible future of Zenith, which is un massively unfortunate, but anyhow, I thank you guys for dropping by. <laughs> Thanks for dropping by. Hey, chat, 
Thanks again, chat. Initially, if you've not already, make sure that like button before you leave. But uh, yeah, with that said, I thank you everybody for your support, moral support, kind words, uh, Patreon members, members of the channel itself, tips, super chats, all that stuff. I greatly appreciate you guys. It means so much to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And until the next Mashuko Mondays, y'all take care. Further in, further within was a plethora. Further, further within was a plethora, plethora, plethora. Further with, Zenith showed sign, Zenith showed signs of, Zenith showed signs of, Zenith showed. Yeah. <laughs>